Hello. So hi, everybody. I think people are still joining, um, but we'll make a start because we want to finish at about 5-2 to give everyone a bit of a screen break. Um, so firstly, a huge thank you for joining us for this webinar, uh, Getting It Right, Hybrid Working, Space Planning and Offices of the Future. Uh, my name is Katie Lorne and I'm part of the research and consultancy team at Baker Stewart and I'll be facilitating today's session uh, along with my colleague Scott who you'll meet a little bit later. Um, and just briefly if you don't know who we are already, Baker Stewart is a data-driven people-focused workplace consultancy and we work with clients across the public and private sector from local authorities to SMEs and large multinationals. So before I introduce you to our panellists I just want to cover a couple of um, housekeeping bits. So firstly, today's webinar is being recorded and we'll share a link with you after the event. So we'd really encourage you to revisit the content yourself and share it with colleagues or anyone who you think might find it helpful. Uh, we also really want to encourage your comments and questions. So please do use the chat function and send in your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and lastly, just to say that we're well aware that most of you have probably been to about a thousand webinars in the past 18 months, but we really put this one together because what we're seeing in our client work is that there's still a lot of uncertainty about how to define the best future workplace strategy because there's no one size fits all solution and, and things keep changing so fast. Um, and there's also a lot of anxiety and hesitation, rightly so, I think, about the best way to get back to the office or even the best way to decide whether you should be going back to the office at all. So the spirit of today's session is really just to do with knowledge sharing and openness and getting our heads together to try and answer some of the really big questions that decision makers and FM and HR professionals are coming up against at the moment. So with that in mind, I'll introduce our speakers. Uh, so I'm joined by Colin Stewart, Jez Underdown and Jamie Rothwell. Uh, Colin is the CEO on, and founder of Baker Stewart and he's been delivering award-winning office environments for the past 20 years um, and he specialised in workplace design and transformation um, early in his career. Uh, Jez is the operational property manager at Portsmouth City Council um, and his background was in social housing before kind of moving across to an operational role and today he's going to give you an insight into how PCC are dealing with the immediate issues that have come about um, uh, in the past 18 months, as well as their kind of future workplace strategy approach. Um, and lastly, Jamie is the founder of Hotbox and the co-founder of SEDIS, a desk and resource booking app. Uh, and he has 25 years experience in the commercial interiors market and has developed innovative products that make a real difference to the people using them. So the plan is that Colin, Jez and Jamie will all have about 10 minutes uh, each to share their knowledge. And that should leave us with plenty of time for the Q&A. So I will hand over to Colin, who's going to start us off. Over to you, Colin. Thanks, Katie. I will uh, quickly share my screen. Um, there's a few slides I'd like to show everybody. So yes, welcome to, to our webinar. As Katie said, I'm Colin Stewart uh, of Baker Stewart. Um, what we've been finding is obviously the pandemic has given a massive step change to the relationship in the office. Um, I've been doing, I've been delivering flexible working projects for 20 years, um, both in my time prior to Baker Stewart, prior to founding Baker Stewart, uh, and since we founded Baker Stewart. But what we've seen, obviously, in the last uh, 18 months is a massive acceleration in the adoption of much more flexible working practices, uh, a removal of the barriers and the resistance that we once saw, uh, and a much wider acceptance uh, that it works. Um, uh, there was a good quote uh, that I've got. It's the Twitter human resources chief, Jennifer Christie, said she believes that flexibility for workers is the fourth industrial revolution because it's making such a fundamental change in the way people work. So what we wanted to cover today is to give you some data. Um, you know, I'll run through some data that we've found um, and some real world experiences um, of what people are planning to do and the issues they face. Um, Flexibility in where, when and how we work is very much in demand at the moment, and I believe it will remain so. There has been a bit of a swing back to a focus, a shift more on offices, which I'll cover in a minute um, with some of the data that we've got. Um, but whether you call it hybrid working, smart working, flexible working, future working, be well is another one I heard, better ways of working or bow well, <laughs> agile working, whatever you call it, it, it has been proven to work. 
um, for many job roles. Um, and even for those job roles that might not be able to adopt it often, there are still activities they perform where degrees of flexibility could be provided. But we need to be mindful that we still, there's still very much demand. We're seeing it from the workshops that we're running. Um, you know, we're running a lot of workshops with staff and with managers. Um, there is still a big demand for face-to-face -face collaboration, socializing, on-the-job learning and mentoring and training. Um, so I would, you know, what we're seeing is the overwhelming majority of organizations are adopting uh, a much more hybrid working model. Um, just realised I didn't have my screen share on properly. There we go. <laughs> Busy chatting away. <laughs> right. Um, so looking at the statistics, um, we've been conducting uh, online engagement surveys for a number of years and uh, they've never been more relevant now. And I'm sure a lot of your organisations have been doing them as well. Um, but we're doing them for across a, a lot of our clients and we've adapted the surveys we do to look very much at home and remote working patterns, as well as the activities and preferences around the office. So we've developed with the International Wellbeing Building Institute, a survey that we've uh, launched or use regularly with our clients. And it's coming up with some interesting results. We sort of regularly aggregate the results and sort of see where, uh, what the general trends are. Um, so what we're seeing is 95% of staff want some form of remote working going forward, um, whatever that might be, whether that be home working, working remote from the office in coffee shops, that sort of thing. 95% want something. Um, of that, um, we're, we're seeing that 56% of respondents would be either unhappy or very unhappy to simply return to the same working patterns they had pre-COVID. Uh, but interestingly, that's down from, that's the current data that we were, we reran the, the data collation in June and the figure was 55%, 56% would be happy or very unhappy. That's down from 75% last October. So we are actually seeing a bit of a drift back to a desire to go back to how things were, which was um, interesting. Um, I still, there is still the, the majority who want some form of hybrid working. And um, interesting also, 55% would choose home as their primary work location, up from 5% before the pandemic. Um, and what we're also seeing is that typically that respondents want two to three days a week in the office. So they do want to work from home some of the time. There's very few, um, only, you know, only about 4% envisage returning to the office five days a week and a similar number who work, want to work from home full time. So it's very much this middle ground of getting some sort of balance. People recognize the need to be in and collaborating. Um, what is also interesting, Twitter did a survey recently, they did an employee survey, um, and it showed that it's the single younger workers who want to come into the office more, actually the younger demographic. And that might be down to the social circles, the fact they're still developing their social circles, down to the training and mentoring aspects that they need. You know, the fact is they join these companies to learn, um, to develop their careers, and actually people are finding it a lot harder to do remotely. So it's something we need to be mindful of when shaping these policies. Um, in terms of days per week, uh, I think it'll come as no surprise to you that Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday seem to be the most popular days. Um, Mondays and Fridays, we will obviously, offices will be a bit of a ghost town. That's if we allow staff preference. What we need, to, what is important is this is balanced with business need. And we're seeing that push-pull actually between the organisational need needing people in across five days a week for customer uh, needs or for team meetings, things like that, um, versus if people were given completely free reign and completely free choice, they would obviously choose to take Mondays and Fridays at home. So it's something to consider about when you're adopting policies around what you actually, uh, what you actually allow. Um, now, another thing we need to be very mindful of is the mental health aspects. There are a lot of positives coming out. We're seeing it in our surveys. Uh, number one is the lack of commute. People love um, A, saving the money and B, saving the time. Um, a better work-life balance, better family time. Um, so people are actually seeing important gains for having some remote working. However, we also need to be mindful of some negative effects. Um, NordVPN uh, have been monitoring their network traffic. And they estimate that the working day has increased by two hours since the start of the pandemic 
in, um, in the UK, France, Spain and Canada, and three hours in the US. So people are working longer hours. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're not taking breaks, more breaks in between. But certainly from my experience, the back to back Zoom call phenomenon is uh, is very telling on stress levels and, you know, on your on your mental health. Um, so, um, yeah, from our own research, 49 percent of people were working more than 40 hours a week and but only 10 percent were contracted to do so. So there is these issues around mental health, job satisfaction and motivation have been dropping in completely remote working environments. So again, it's really important that I think we find some sort of middle ground um, in terms of office work and working from home. Um, there is going to be issues if we allow staff to completely isolate uh, to work five days a week, well, uh, five days a week, uh, a week from home. That they might self-isolate to a certain extent, withdraw from contact with the team, and that can have a very major impact on their mental health, corporate culture. Um, and interaction with their teammates. Um, so, interesting enough, what are in, uh, what are organisations doing? Verge Sense, you might have seen Verge Sense report that came out about three, four weeks ago. Um, they looked. This is a global report, so it's not just specifically around uh, the UK. But eighty four percent of organisations were planning to return to the office in some form. Interesting that sixteen percent weren't. Um, Sixty five percent are planning to do that in quarter three. Um, and of those returning, 74% were looking at a hybrid model, 26% traditional. That, that surprised me. Now, bear in mind, this is global. Uh, I anticipate certainly all the clients we're talking to all want some form of hybrid working, might not necessarily work for all job roles. Um, and 62% of respondents said the number of meetings had increased since COVID began. <laughs> yes, definitely. I found that from my experience. Um, only 5% of companies expect to return to normal when the pandemic is over. So everybody, just about everybody, 95% see some form of hybrid working or some form of change going forward. Um, I also wanted to show you this. It, interesting enough, this is the Metricus Occupancy Index. Now this looks at levels of occupancy in its um, in the UK, uh, they've put, got sensors in a number of offices that were put in a number of them pre-pandemic, and they've been measuring levels of occupancy. Um, and as you can see, we're now up to 60%. So this is not overall, that, so the 100% is not 100% um, occupancy. This is a percentage of the peak. So as you can see, they're up to 60% occupancy uh, compared to what it was pre-pandemic. Uh, it's been a steady gradual return to the office uh, and I can see that uh, continuing um, where we end up where we'll end up will we end up at about 70 percent something like that as our as our norm I'm not sure but it's interesting stats to show there's been a steady since the second lockdown there's been a steady return to the office very consistent steady climb in the figures um, so before I hand over to Jez and Jamie I just wanted to set the scene in terms of some of the key issues around um, that we need to tackle. So all corporates, all organizations need to tackle a number of issues. There are no easy answers. We're working with a number of organizations and are going through these decision points they need to make. And for whatever, whatever you choose to do, there are downsides. Uh, so you need to be, and you know, each organization is unique and you need to consider your own unique circumstances, the job roles, your, your people, your customers, changing customer need, all very important factors in that. Um, but the things you need to, the questions you need to ask, which you know, hopefully my colleagues might uh, illuminate you on a few answers, is do you give staff free choice in where they work? What are the implications of that? Will we have ghost towns Monday or Friday? How do we deliver customer service and ensure interaction between teams and people are available at the right time if we allow people free choice? How much homeworking uh, is the norm? Should you have a tariff? Um, you know, not necessarily set rotors. That's another thing. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, how flexible does this need to be? If you allow, if you set a rotor, actually, what about changing customer needs? If someone's not in, how do you deal with that? Does business priority need to take precedence? I would suggest it does. And how do you allow for different job roles? How do you ensure fairness? Uh, you know, if it's at line manager's discretion, how do you ensure you get sort of fair treatment between different teams. 
and between individuals with different job roles. Um, it could end up with a very much them and us approach if we're not careful. And there are also issues around contracts and tax um, in terms of your primary base of work. You need to be mindful of it if you are changing people's contracts uh, or allowing them wholesale uh, work from home. Um, we also need to think about what the purpose of the office is. You know, what is it now? Do we need the office to go in and sit at a desk and tap away at a keyboard if we can do it happily at home? Bearing in mind that not everybody can work from home successfully. Not everyone's got the right personality. Not everyone's got the right role. Not everyone's got the right home circumstances. So uh, we do need to be mindful of that. But is the office going to be much more a collaboration hub? Somewhere you go to meet with colleagues. Somewhere you go to meet with customers. Um, or does a lot of that still happen virtually? Um, could it be that you have a main central office with local hubs? Um, how does that address customer need? Actually, we're working with a number of local councils, um, Portsmouth included, and a lot of the move is to uh, move services um, locally, to go to the customer, go to the residents. Um, but what facilities do we need in the office and how many of the different types of facilities um, do we need to deal with peaks in demand? But how can we keep that effectiveness and efficiency? Um, and one of the ways we're finding is actually limiting the supply of desks, moving much more away from a desk heavy office to much more of a uh, collaboration meeting type facility. Um, but in that case, do you need desk booking systems? How do you, uh, how do you make sure the facilities are available for the people when they come in, um, especially if I've traveled an hour and a half? Um, and you've got some issues around rotors you need to think about, times of day. You know, some organizations are adopting rotors. Um, some or, but then the problem, there are a lot of downsides with that. If you have set days, if you have rotors, there are issues if you need it up to the individual. Um, as I said, you'll be peaks Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, how do we get the right people interacting face to face? How do we do that? It's important for training and mentoring, getting the right people in at the right time um, without being dictatorial. So these are all balances we need to strike. Um, and do we need some sort of core hours system? How do we ensure that customers are available? How do we give people the flexibility? One thing people have really enjoyed from the pandemic is being able to pop down the road and pick up the kids from school at four o'clock, you know, because they're no longer in the office. They can go and have, you know, and then finishing off their work later. But how do you make that work if you want teams to have contact between teams? Do you adopt some sort of core hours uh, issue? Um, so it's just setting the scene in terms of some of the key issues we need to challenge. But I'll, um, need to tackle, but I'll hand over to Jez now. We can talk about what Portsmouth have done and you know, how they've approached some of those issues. Thanks, Colin. And uh, yes, I'm Jez Landerdown and I work for Portsmouth City Council, uh, leading the facilities team there. So um, it's been a challenging 18 months. Um, but on a positive note, I think uh, arguably it's generally moved the sector away from toilet rolls and cleaning to uh, a footing where people understand more the importance and influence of good facilities management and office space. Um, I don't have a, a slide deck to share um, there. I mean, there's so much that can be discussed here office design and requirements, processes, people and people management, and obviously well-being, that it, it really is a difficult task to structure some notes and know where to start. And no doubt I will be missing loads out in the time constraints of 10 minutes. But I suppose that in a way echoes um, Colin's sentiments about how topical this currently is. I mean, there must be a huge percentage of the population that are currently looking towards their employers to see how they will react to the views and desires of their workforces and the technological gains and advancements made over the last 18 months. I know that this is certainly the situation in Portsmouth. I certainly hope I can do the subject some justice, um, but whilst I can probably aid discussion, I certainly don't have all the answers, but my um, email address is available as part of this session or contact me on LinkedIn if anybody does. Um, so PCC is a unitary authority um, and serving a densely populated city provides the range of services you'd expect, um, education, children's and adults, social services to name a few, um, but we do more uncommonly also retain and manage our own social housing stock. Um, the services bring a range of needs from an FM perspective, but also a range of customers. Um, so whichever way you may look at it, funding and finance, perhaps, um, as an example, you'd find a pretty complex organisation. Um, unfortunately for me and my project team colleagues, this would also include looking at our organisation from a working styles perspective and how they may need to adapt for the future. 
So a bit more uh, about Portsmouth. Our main civic office building pre-pandemic could have had anywhere around 2,000 people on any given day, um, with some areas leased to tenants such as the NHS. And this provides a lot of focus of the work we've been doing. But we also need to be mindful, certainly from a facilities perspective, that this touches all of our employees working across all of our facilities and functions. That wider inclusivity is actually something we're trying to focus on in Portsmouth. So pre-pandemic, um, we had a very traditional office set up, some hot desk in, but almost functioning on every employee having their own desk. Um, our main office building is very much a civic building of the 70s, large, uh, lots of brown glass windows that you can't open. Um, and as it's 15 years old, uh, 50 years old, I should say, um, it's a bit tired and is full of stuff. Uh, there's storage everywhere with thousands of files and folders that hopefully everyone now realises they don't actually need. Although a year ago, they probably would have sworn um, that they were the centre of their working worlds. Um, I like it a bit to what my loft might look like, actually, if I continue to live in my house for another 10 years or so. Um, so during the pandemic, while services have continued to be provided and the pandemic bringing its own workload, uh, the building occupancy has dropped to four to 500 people per day, where it remains as we continue to hold the work from home, if you can, position, um, in part to provide some space to react to changing guidelines and dates and advice from central government. So pre-pandemic we had just begun to understand our use or inefficient use of space and the January 2020 space utilization study um, working with Baker Stewart meant we knew we were only using about 50% of our desks and staff were expressing the desire for change then. Um, reflecting back when I was preparing some notes uh, for this um, presentation it just dawned on me that the staff views we um, were experiencing in January 2020 were far more conservative about what was possible than recent engagement, which again, I suppose, displays the impact of working practices the pandemic has brought, really. Um, that work could have been at risk of getting dusty on a shelf with all the other folders and files, um, but we'll never know. The pandemic really has pressed the accelerator pedal on attitudes and an ability to change working practices. And with perhaps no real certainty how we live with COVID in the coming months or years, uh, I think a real need to have a flexibility to cope with whatever may come next. And I suppose there are a couple of points I want to pick up on already. So firstly, that pace of change, um, in part as a reaction to the pandemic, and now the desire not to go back to the before. Whilst the pandemic has been obviously really helpful catalyst for change in terms of working styles and office design, I think it can also be viewed as a bit of a hindrance. So um, at PCC, we've had to try and draw a distinction for us between two clear work streams, recovering from a pandemic being one and transitioning to a new way of working the other. And there are a number of reasons for this, um, but probably to highlight some of the important ones. Capacity has been an issue. Um, everyone is working unbelievably hard. And whilst it's beginning to change, um, obviously not the working hard bit, um, but probably just the number of unrelenting demands, we didn't have the ability to make massive changes on top of everything else. But also there really is that feeling of the unknown. So could we develop robust employment policies now when things almost change on a weekly basis? And there's also always been an uncertainty about how our customers may want to look to engage with council services with no COVID restrictions, with habits potentially changed through the pandemic with more remote access to services. And hopefully I can talk to this approach in a second. Um, the second point I want to make quickly is that there are going to be so many different starting points here for organisations, depending on a number of factors. Pre-pandemic adoption of agile working practices, estate issues, age, ownership or condition of buildings, um, and probably a major one for many budget. So certainly for PCC, the age and condition of our main civic building is a limiting factor as how far do we go in redesigning office layouts, for example, when there are big decisions to be made about the future of the building itself. But regardless of any barriers, we've accepted the need for change informed by uh, widespread consultation with staff. And this is an important step in itself, I think. Um, and I do actually really like that quote from the Twitter HR person that Colin referenced about this being another industrial revolution, um, as I do wonder uh, the impact on organisations who don't develop, um, particularly from a recruitment and retention perspective. So conscious that I could just be waffling on here, um, as I did say, it was quite difficult to structure some notes. Uh, so what have we done at PCC? 
Um, well, we've recognised the need for a number of important areas to be working closely together. Um, HR, um, so obviously employment policies, learning, development, and obviously really importantly, staff wellbeing. Um, facilities, so our management and design of space. Um, IT, with the software and tools that we need to work differently. And um, a look at process as well. So recognising that these will need to evolve as working practices do. So together we have formed a project group called Connectivity, um, as there really is no easy way for one strand to, to advance alone, really. Um, and we all need to be working together. So we tried to make that clear distinction between phases of work through clear communication. We're covering from a pandemic now and looking to make more formal changes to working styles later in the year. It does make me chuckle, actually, um, when pretty much everyone I have spoken to sees that sort of 50-50 home office split the best uh, going forward. Because I just wonder how this is known now when we don't really know what business demands going forward may be. Um, and for me, I think the optimum model is more around providing choice. So um, we've recognised the complexity of the, or the organisation means uh, we just can't dictate from the centre and have therefore, um, guided by some central principles, tasked every service to write their own interim working practices. These are flexible and live documents, providing all the ability to flex to changing needs and requirements over the coming months. If it's not working from an employee, employer or service user basis, then change it. So these documents are also invaluable learning for HR in terms of considering how we develop our policies going forward and what our requirements might be. Importantly, we've worked closely with our unions through the pandemic and continue to do so. So they have an influence on direction and they know what will be coming in their members um, direction also, which I think is a big aid to potential success. So I think it's probably also worth a nod here, actually, um, to the role of managers going forward. I think there's a real need for managers to come to the party in a big way. Um, and they're going to have a huge role in adapting to managing and developing a potentially completely different workforce with new skills required. Um, so the ability to set interim working practices with their teams can surely only, can surely only assist this. So I'm a little bit conscious of time. Um, so I'm just going to try and sum up a few other points fairly quickly. Um, so budget. So obviously that's something that is going to be pertinent to, to, to everybody, really. And whilst there's an argument that um, getting working styles and facilities right will pay for themselves pretty quickly, it's difficult to suddenly find large sums of money, particularly when COVID is stretched by its uh, budgets anyway. So our response to this has been to try and identify what we see as the most important aspects to invest in now and quickly. And for us, there are three that we were looking to implement straight away. So hybrid meeting space, um, something that's come up in all of our staff engagement, but it's pretty obvious anyway, I think, really, um, that a dispersed workforce means that we're now experiencing remote and physical access to meetings on a regular basis. So we're looking to install a range of um, video technology across um, our meeting rooms, but we intend to use a range of equipment, actually, um, experimenting and trialing different things in different rooms um, because we want to learn what works best and what staff prefer rather than just putting all in all our eggs in one basket now um, a space management system um, which will probably be music to jamie's uh, jamie's ears um, we're going to be rolling out a desk management uh, system which really is the top of the list for me um, so we can better control and manage our space and give staff confidence that they will need, they will have somewhere appropriate to work when needed. Um, for me, the data we will gather from this will massively help in shaping the type and number of physical assets we need going forward. Um, coupled to this, we're looking to standardize our desk setup so that everyone again has confidence, they have the right tools when they come into the office. Um, for us, it will be the McDonaldization of our, um, our, office, accommodation, our office accommodation. Um, we're also investing in some staff resource project management, for example, to drive this project forward. Um, the importance, I think, of this moment of change can't be underplayed. Um, and therefore, there's a need to keep the momentum to remove any risk of reverting to old styles of work. And I think even from these points, you can see that we want to take a position where we want to, to experiment now, live, um, continually learning going forward. 
for us, um, this is just the end of the beginning, really. We really see the next few months as a really important learning period for getting this right going forward um, and adapting to an ever-changing um, societal position. And I think uh, the last point that I want to make before I probably spend Jamie's presentation remembering things I wish I'd said um, is around ventilation. Um, this certainly for us is um, going to be big in terms of being able to demonstrate air quality to staff. Um, for me, I think it's the new visual reassurance staff are going to want going forward, um, replacing perhaps people walking around cleaning touch points all day. Um, referenced in the latest government guidelines, we're going to roll out continuous CO2 monitoring in our buildings to be able to demonstrate to staff that the air is as fresh as it can be. Um, I know this is something that staff have had a real focus on over the past 12 months. Um, there's probably been all, always been that um, sense that coughs and colds um, can be attributable to, to our heating and ventilation system. Um, so being able to reassure staff that the air in our buildings is fresh um, and uh, as safe as possibly can be, I think will be um, the biggest thing that we can potentially get right in terms of if we want people to come back to the office. Um, as I say, there is probably a wealth of information that I um, would like to share with you guys, but hopefully some of that will come out in the question and answer sessions. Um, and I've been able to give you a flavour of, 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 of an approach. So um, on that, I will pass over to you, Jamie. Thank you, Jess, and good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, for joining the webinar this morning. Let me just um, share my <coughs> screen with you. Two seconds. Here we go. Um, cool. Okay. So, um, Colin, Jess, thank you for your um, opening comments and insightful information. Um, I just wanted to talk to you today about the experiences and challenges um, we at Hotbox and SETIs um, have seen over the years and the challenges um, that we see in the workplace now as our customers and um, other organisations continue to grapple with um, the changing pressures of creating a safe and flexible work environment um, that their staff want to um, um, come back to and work in. Bear with me. Thank you. Um, so just as, as Katie kind of highlighted, I've been involved within the commercial interiors market for probably um, just over 25 years now. And in that time, I had the privilege of working with many great clients and partners. Um, as an inquisitive person, um, if a problem presents itself, uh, I very often feel drawn to investigating it and trying to come up with um, a solution. And 20 years ago, such a, a problem presented itself Agile and flexible workplaces uh, were beginning to become more and more popular. However, for each project we did at the time, um, no one had thought about personal storage. Um, if you're going to sit anywhere or share a desk, uh, what happens to your personal work tools? The standard issue pedestal just wouldn't cut it. So how could we replace that? So the product I invented um, to solve this problem was Hotbox. <clears throat> and 20 years later, Hotbox is now the global market leader for portable personal storage. Um, and the reason I mention this is because this gives us a fantastic insight into how in organisations um, evolve and what people value in a workplace. And as we return to the workplace and Agile um, perhaps evolves into hybrid, what are people looking for? What do they expect and how do we develop products or services to deliver this? <clears throat> as you may have um, taken from both Colin and Jezza's um, um, presentations, it does seem that every day there is a different survey. There is no one solution to this. Um, and everybody has an opinion on what hybrid working means. Is the office dead? Is the office alive? Do we prefer to work at home or do we prefer to work in the office? Um, a recent survey in the US uh, where we have a big client base um, conducted by a company called Global Workplace Analytics I think reflects the problem facing many organizations. It, it suggests that 76% of people want some form of flexibility to choose when and where they work. Of course, you could also say that from this data, more people want to work in the office more days than at home or vice versa. But really, I think more than anything, it shows that there is no one fit for all. Um, and this makes it very difficult for organizations to try and plan for their future way of working 
if they want to keep their employees on board and a part of that process. And as Colin um, and Jez suggested, will those organisations not adopting agile or hybrid working be left behind as employees with very different priorities now vote with their feet and find organisations that do want to adapt and embrace change? So what might the future hold? Um, again, according to a recent Gallup survey um, of the leading chief uh, human resource officers in the US, um, they stated that flexibility within a framework is the future of work. And Gallup also found that the most popular solution by far is a mix of on-site and in-person work days, um, the well-known hybrid arrangement orientated towards the location department role and employee. So how do organisations think about making this work? Before we talk any further about the impact of the changes COVID have brought, um, I'd like you all to think back to before COVID and how many times you commuted to a workplace only to find no desk or meeting space available, or someone was using the meeting room that you thought you'd booked. For me, it happened a lot and it was very frustrating. So actually in October 2019, um, I founded uh, SEDES with a good friend of mine, Jacob Hinson who's the uh, founder of a company called eLocker. Um, they manufacture smart wireless electronic locks. Um, we set about trying to develop a smart desk and resource booking platform that was cloud-based and simple to use. And then came COVID. <clears throat> so could technology help make workplaces more flexible for both the employer and the employee in the post-COVID area? This was the next big question um, that we wanted to answer. So during the lockdowns, um, we asked the employees of our customers what their concerns were with heading back to the office. And the four most common answers were, I would like to be able to choose when and where I work. As we've seen from the numerous surveys, flexibility is a key choice for all employees wanting to return to the workplace. How do I reduce my anxiety about commuting to an office that may not have any space left? For many of us, um, particularly in the South, getting to work involves commuting on busy public transport. Understandably, who wants to do this without the certainty of a place to work or meet once we arrive? I want to know that the workplace I choose to work from will not be overcrowded. Even as social distancing rules are relaxed, I still want to know that my space will be respected and the workplace will be a safe one when I get there. And lastly, I need to make sure my team are all in on the same day in the same area at the same time, because if they're not, I can't be effective, productive or collaborate, which are very important things. And when we spoke to the um, uh, facilities uh, teams within the organisations, um, they had similar concerns, but but again, from a, from a business perspective, very different. And their concerns were, how do I manage who should come into the office and when? And if you think that, you know, even now, most offices are still run using a manual or partially automated way of reserving desks, meeting rooms or other resources. And relying on a manual system like Outlook um, via receptionist or the facilities department just isn't going to cut it anymore. Both employee and employer needs are just far too complex. The need to manage desks and resources um, in a smart, automated way has never been greater. How do I make it easy so that people actually use it? Um, again, technology can be great, but if it's not simple to use, people just don't use it. How do I make sure that there are enough desks and resources for my teams and that occupancy levels um, uh, are not exceeded? We need to be able to plan for peaks or troughs and adapt if there are further changes. Um, this can only be done or should be done if it's data driven, not guesswork. Simple installation, no on-site hardware or use of the organization's intranet. Um, this was, was really key to people. Anything that's hardwired is complex and costly to install uh, and maintain. Um, and particularly at the moment, um, people will continue to move things around as they experiment or test things. Um, so whatever um, system that people used, it needed to be um, flexible and scalable. Uh, they also asked us, how do I keep my team safe and ensure business continuity in the event of another um, outbreak, uh, COVID outbreak? 
How do I designate which desks are available to book or create teams so that team leaders can create bookings? Um, how do I know that my team actually come in and where they actually sit? Again, relying on a manual system like Outlook or, or some other uh, old school system just means that a person makes a booking. How do I know that they actually turn up and use the resource they've booked? You, you just don't know. How do I make informed decisions about my space so that I can understand which spaces are actually being used and when? Um, I, they need to know where people sit and the resource they actually use um, is really important so that, that organisations can make informed decisions about the space, um, how it's used and plan for a better future experience. So this is the, 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 the research that we used to develop um, CEDIS. Um, so CEDIS um, is a cloud-based platform, so it's infinitely scalable, scalable and can be accessed via a web browser or a mobile phone app, so it can be booked on the go. It has a management dashboard that gives um, the facilities manager uh, clear visibility of all sites. So you can see um, the desks, room and resources um, that are being used. You can highlight um, no shows or cancel bookings. Um, so you can see how, how things are, are working. You can choose to set access days, times and permissions, like access to specific sites, floors or areas and to automate where people can work and when and that's really important um, so that you can switch areas on and off very quickly um, you can switch desks off really quickly you can react to how um, how situations change you can choose which desk meeting room or resource are active and bookable to maintain social distancing policy and enable more rooms um, or desks as rules are relaxed you can set different occupancy levels by site, floor and area to suit individual needs. Um, so it's not one, um, one size that fits all. And one of the key differences um, that we deployed within CEDIS um, and based on this um, understanding that, that data will drive everything now is that we've integrated very smart QR code technology, which means that each desk, meeting room or resource can be given a unique location so that employees actually have to check in and check out using their smartphone, so it's completely touch-free, that verifies that they've turned up and used the resource that they've booked. So the QR codes gives us a better insight into how the workplace is being used so you can identify areas that are not being used um, and use this to make informed decisions about them. QR codes um, confirm check-in and check-out to identify no-shows as well, um, and that prevents resource hogging. And QR codes confirm who sat where or used which resource, so that if the event of a, of a further COVID outbreak, you can track and trace them easily. Um, Within the system as well, we've designed it so that uh, individuals can raise a private flag, which notifies uh, human resources um, if they've tested positive for COVID. And the, the detailed and exportable logs that we provide within the system allow them to show how often desks, rooms or resources are used, which can also be used to show um, any other employees who may have come into close contact with the employee who has raised the flag. We can also assign team leaders who can create their own teams so they can make central bookings on behalf of all team members, which is great to um, simplify booking. Basically, when a team leader makes a booking, um, the members of the team receive an email and it tells them um, the day, time that they need to be in and they receive uh, and they can use that email basically as a boarding pass to enter the building. And we can assign areas to specific teams so that they can create neighbourhoods um, and uh, move on um, from there. So that's um, that's where we are with CEDIS now. Um, so the question we asked in the beginning was, could technology help make the workplace more flexible? Well, yes, um, we believe um, we can. Um, we believe uh, that because the future workplace will continue to evolve. There isn't one thing that fits all, uh, and so that it must be data driven. Um, and you have to know how people use the space to make the space. Um, 
thank you for your time. And um, if you need any more information, please um, contact me directly or contact uh, through Katie or Colin. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, all three of you for your insights. And there's some real practical solutions in there that I think will be really, really helpful to people in the audience. Um, so I'll now hand over to Scott, who's our client relationship manager here at Baker Stewart, um, and he's gonna be chairing the Q&A. And I know we've got some really interesting questions that have come in already. So I will hand over to you. Thanks, Katie. Uh, so there's some questions that have obviously come through. Um, first of which I think, Jez, initially for, for yourself, really, um, what's the biggest failure of the past 18 months for you? Is there something that uh, you have tried that hasn't really worked? No, we're, we're perfect, obviously. <laughs> um, no, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I don't, I think, I think I don't really want to focus on the last 18 months in terms of mistakes and failures, because I think the last 18 months really have shown, um, certainly for our organisation, how hard um, uh, people can work, you know, how versatile they can be, um, how adaptable they can be to a difficult situation while still maintaining a set of very complex um services so I, I actually think the mistakes are probably older than 18 months and i think the mistakes are probably resting on laurels um when you know the opportunity to change and develop has been there and i'm thinking particularly around um storage folders and files you know a paper-based system you know there's been plenty of opportunity to um to advance those and develop those um and i so and that's just one example, really. Um, there's other examples that we've come across um, during the pandemic where, you know, some services or, you know, have personally chosen to rely on um, desktop computers as their go to um, device in the office, as opposed to the flexibility of um, laptops. And obviously now everybody is using laptops and we've overcome a lot of the, um, you know, software issues and things like that, 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 that were there and probably could have been addressed at the time. So, you know, I think I think the bigger mistakes are uh, are historic ones rather than kind of necessarily, you know, mistakes that have been made over the, you know, the past 18 months, really. I can probably, from our experience, add in, Scott, there. Um, in terms of planning the future, the biggest mistake I've seen, we're working, as, you, as I said earlier, we're working with a lot of clients, is those that are not consulting with their people. Um, there's some, some people are, the, the board are deciding what the policy should be without consultation. And when we do consult, we are hearing some quite a lot of negatives around a lack of trust, around a lack of flexibility. Um, on the on the flip side, it's also setting there's a problem with setting expectations uh, of staff that um, they can have what they want, they can have their cake and eat it to a certain extent. The problem is business need, organisational need, customer need has to take priority. And although it, it's important to give people flexibility and choice that flexibility and choice still has to be within the context of delivering services to the customer, being able to deliver, interact with your colleagues. So uh, there's a balance here between what the corporate leadership thinks is appropriate and what people, the people within the organisation want, uh, their preference, and getting some sort of happy medium between the two. So there needs to be extensive consultation, but consultation caveated that organisation need, customer need takes precedence, certainly won't be sort of my uh, take on that. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, another one, uh, Colin, sort for yourself is, we're decommissioning our current office and looking for a smaller space, and we might have a couple of months while we're looking, and we're worried about how to maintain company culture while we don't have a home. Any tips? Uh, communication so it's, it's simple as much as possible what we've done actually i mean it's uh we, we've moved to a much more hybrid model um we're now using co-working spaces with a small footprint is just put in place team catch-ups not just team catch-ups um you know a, a coffee catch-up on a wednesday lunchtime so we have a standing thing in you know, the usual things of quizzes you know once a month but we actually have a, a coffee chat 
Um, it's a really important point that uh, you maintain contact, that you maintain that sense of team. Being able to have people just chat um, helps keep that interaction, keeps a degree of the culture going. So actually getting everyone to schedule, say we do it every Wednesday lunchtime, get everyone to schedule uh, Wednesday lunchtime. You don't schedule a meeting. You actually sit down with a coffee and have a chat and you chat. You don't chat about work. You chat about the stuff you chat about first five minutes, 10 minutes, you're in the office, the football, the, you know, the Olympics, um, you know, Love Island, whatever it might be. You know? um, but that's important because that keeps that team bonding. And there's a real, it is a great question because there is a real danger that people start to disenfranchise themselves just because of that lack of contact. I think the other bit to that as well, Colin, is, you know, take it as an opportunity to, you know, to develop and improve your culture further. You know, it, it, there's that there's an opportunity to do to do that, just accepting that, you know, existing um, culture and at least in practices work, you know, give some thought to what organisation you might want to grow into. Excellent. Thank you, uh, gents. Um, Next question is, we're also having issues with ventilation. Staff want to be able to open windows, but many of our serviced offices um, have centrally managed artificial ventilation systems and can't open the windows. Should I move location or how do I address this with staff? It's interesting. We've been doing this research actually with another client. Now, we're working with Jez actually in terms of the CO2 monitoring, but we're working with another client who the CO very, very keen to open windows. Um, Actually, the research and statistics are showing man mechanical ventilation, you know, artificial fresh air, because it's manageable and controllable. If it's done right, big stress, is actually healthier. The problem with opening windows, it depends on the depth of your floor plate, whether the windows are open. And obviously, we're going to get issues in winter when people don't open windows because it's cold. Um, you actually get a much more stagnant air. With mechanical ventilation, if, big if, it's done right and you up the ratio you don't recirculate you up the ratio of fresh air and you monitor um, especially if you know what Jez is doing is he's putting co2 monitors in to make sure there isn't any stagnant air um, levels of co2 are a really really good indicator of where your stagnant air is and so where potentially you've got covid particles or whatever gathering so monitoring that is is quite important and doing that you reassure staff doing that you can make sure you're getting the right number of air changes um, per hour and you also, if you do that, you, if you're in a landlord controlled building, you can hopefully raise it with the landlord. So it's a big if. If you can get control of it, or if you can get a landlord that will be responsive, um, then, and, and is going to up the fresh air ratio or, or eliminate recirculation, actually mechanical ventilation is healthier. So in terms of answering the question, that's the if, that's what you should do, try and find a space that you can control that because then also you can do the CO2 monitoring, which reassures staff, you can make the CO2 levels even visible. You know, you can have heat maps, you can have dashboards that staff can view, and that's a way of giving them the reassurance. And Jez, I'm not sure if you want to add to that, actually, about the reassurance aspect. Um, no, only in that, you know, it, as I kind of alluded to in, in, in my presentation, you know, being able to share evidence with um, staff directly to be able to, you know, um, a year ago my knowledge of ventilation wasn't what it is now because of covid but being able to um you know share data physical hard evidence with staff to say you know this is the current situation um you know this is the amount of co2 these are the acceptable levels in an office you know these are the other things that are in your air this you know it, it, it is the reassurance i think people are going to be wanting to look for as opposed to an email that just says yeah we yeah, it's fine. <laughs> um, because, you know, that's the day, you know, that's the danger otherwise, really, is just sort of not being able to give that sort of concrete position. Thanks, gents. Um, I know we're uh, just keeping an eye on the time, but there's a very, very good question that's coming here. So um, working from home during the pandemic is different from working from home outside of it. Do you think this will drive an initial return that will flatten out as time goes on and companies get to grips with distributed working? So, Colin, do you want to take that one initially? Uh, yeah, interesting one. I've seen a big change. I used to love working from home um, pre-pandemic. It was my day of retreat, my little day I could go and get some work done because nobody, there used to be this mindset that they, uh, if you're working from home, people left you alone. Oh, he's working from home. You can't be disturbed. Obviously, 
you know, that's wrong. Of course, they can contact me. But actually, it meant I'd have a day to get work done. Now, it's the back-to-back -back Zoom calls. Literally, the it almost seems like we're having a lot more meet. Well, we are having a lot more meetings than we used to. Uh, and actually, how do we get that balance? And the other issue we're going to have with homework and going forward is when meetings become hybrid themselves. Uh, a Teams meeting, Zoom meeting works when everybody's virtual or everybody's face to face in the office. Unless you've got really good technology, how do you ensure the experience for those joining remotely in a hybrid meeting with some in the office, some at home, is going to not lead to a second class experience for those at home? How you need you need good technology, you need the people in the room to behave in a different way. Um, so actually, I think that might drive a return to the office when people start doing more of those hybrid meetings and realize they feel a bit alienated. Um, and I, I don't think we can carry on with this relentless pressure of, um, I mean, working from home as well, you, you know, going to the office, we, I have been in a few times, and it's a real breath of fresh air, uh, especially if you've got the natural ventilation happening, <laughs> or good mechanical ventilation. No, it's, it, 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 it's that change of scene. So, yeah, it, it's interesting. I'm not sure... Yes, I, 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 I would say yes. I, I actually do agree with that statement that, um, you know, working for working from home during the pandemic is different from working uh, at home outside of it. Um, I do think that we will see an initial return um, to work Every, like throughout the pandemic. We've obviously maintained um, uh, data on how many people have attended the offices what each day, but we haven't changed our approach. Um, and each time that we've seen a relax of any guidelines um, centrally by the government, we've seen a natural increase in numbers in our building, um, which at times has needed to be managed um, just to, to see our approach. So I, I think I think we will see um, uh, a peak of people wanting to come back, um, you know, maybe sort things out. Um, socialize you know see see people they haven't seen for a long time but i do think that as organizations get to grips with what society or working practices look like going forward that that will definitely um definitely sort of tape taper off the commute i think will will help when, when, you know as we mentioned when people get uh realize that actually how annoying it is to sit in a car for an hour each morning um, when you could actually finish an hour earlier from work in the afternoon if you didn't have to do that. I, you know, I think that in itself will, will, will be a key driver for change. We've actually seen that with some clients who started the return. Um, people who were initially keen to come back um, have come in and actually said, oh, I didn't, I've forgotten about the commute. I didn't actually enjoy that. Um, so are we actually going to see this pendulum swing starting to come back towards the office and then maybe swing back again towards more home remote working? Who knows? It's very uncertain times. Uh, we've just got to be flexible in, in our approach, I think. Jamie, anything that you would like to, uh, to add to what they've said? Yeah, I think um, <laughs> the, the biggest um problem with this is that when you come back to the workplace it's very different to the workplace that you left before so I think a lot of people have this romantic idea of what the workplace is going to be we all come in and we all sit next to each other and we have a chat and uh, and, and do the things we did before but it isn't like that anymore um, you know and, and that will evolve slightly but you know we've seen a lot of people come back to the office and um, you know before there might have been a thousand people in there but there's now 100 people in there they're so spread out um and, and to respect social distance and you can't go near to them um it's just not like it was was before so i think people will come back to an office but they'll kind of realize well actually it's not the same as it was before i can do the work that i was doing there at home um so yeah i, I everybody wants to kind of come back and try it but yes i do agree that i think um people will kind of adapt and um, um and there'll be a reshake of, of, of why people actually need to come into the office fantastic thanks gents um some very good questions there that we've uh, we've covered off uh katie i'm, I'm conscious of time so um yeah, yeah um yeah so i guess we'll finish up there so just a huge thank you to our panel you've been just great and thank you for the people that joined us and there's some really interesting questions that we didn't get to, so we may try and devise a way of answering those um, for you as well. 
Um, and yeah, if you have any further questions, do get in contact with Colin, Jez, Jamie or Scott. Um, so their contact details are here, but we'll include them in the email with the recording, with the slides and everything. So yeah, we hope this has been helpful to you and you've enjoyed it um, and hope to speak more soon. Okay. All right. Have a great rest of day, everybody. Thank you.